Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for coming. I'm aware of the time, so we're going to try and stay on uh, target as quick uh, as best we can. Uh, my name is Jeff Dover. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Health Kinesiology and Applied Physiology. Uh, I'll be talking uh, first at this PERFORM webinar. Uh, my talk is just a brief summary of a study we've recently done here and submitted for publication. I'll be talking for about 10 minutes, and then afterwards I'm going to get out of the way so that our our keynote speaker, Dr. Caron from the University of Montreal, is going to be speaking afterwards. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to get going. Uh, I'll share my screen here. Uh, Wendy, can you just let me know that, that this is working? All good. OK, great. Perfect. So the title of my talk is Athlete Fear Avoidance, Depression and Anxiety are Associated with Acute Concussion Symptoms. This was a study that was done by one of my grad students, Gabrielle Gamelin, and one of my science college students, Kozar, uh, that we've recently submitted to, to be published and it's under review right now. So I'm excited to share the results with you today. So in terms of a background with concussions or mild traumatic brain injuries, it's a significant problem in uh, healthcare and society today. Uh, there's approximately 50 million traumatic brain injuries occur internationally each year. And uh, there's also an estimated 1.6 to 3.8 uh, million uh, sports related concussions each year in the US alone. What everyone can agree with is that these numbers are inaccurate, they're too low. Uh, there's probably, there's significantly more head injuries that occur than that. And partially that's because of the challenge in assessing a concussion or diagnosing it. They're very tricky. And so the actual numbers are significantly more than what's reported. So it's a real problem. And the real challenge, what makes this a challenge with assessing a concussion is primarily due to the variability in symptoms. Uh, you can have a significant concussion and only have uh, a headache or one symptom, and you could have a mild concussion and still have numerous symptoms. So that's what really makes the assessment a challenge. And so anything that could explain that variability would be something that um, would be important for us. So, so one of the problems with the symptoms is that they vary, as I just talked about. Uh, they're also present in non-concussed individuals. So for example, a headache um, can occur if you've had a concussion or it could be because you're dehydrated. It doesn't necessarily mean it's tied to a concussion. And so that makes the, the, the symptoms tough. Uh, as of now, there's no single diagnostic test that can diagnose a concussion. Uh, the best thing that's being used right now is something called the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool or the SCAT, which is a series of questions about symptoms and severity, and then it has a few other tests right now. Uh, so that's the one that's most commonly used. Uh, okay, so in terms of the symptoms specifically in diagnosing from a concussion, there's been some preliminary evidence to show uh, psychological factors and symptoms of the concussion are related. So things like stress or anxiety levels after a mild traumatic brain injury are also uh, indicated as predictors of post-concussion syndrome. So this is symptoms that have really prolonged for a, for a long period of time after a concussion. People that have had more anxiety, for example, will report more concussion symptoms for a longer period of time. And that's becoming pretty well established now. Something that's been a bit more uh, relevant recently is something called the fear avoidance model. So the fear avoidance model was originally uh, developed to explain why some people develop chronic pain and others do not. So it's very well rooted in chronic low back pain and a few other conditions. Uh, it hasn't been examined that much in concussions. There's some recent evidence to suggest that catastrophizing and fear avoidance, which are aspects of the fear avoidance model, are related to post-concussion symptoms. So again, the symptoms that have really prolonged after a long period of time after the initial concussion, people that have high catastrophizing, which is a negative orientation towards pain, will report more concussion symptoms for a prolonged period of time, like several months afterwards. Uh, but this is most of this research has been done in post concussion symptoms, like I said, which is several months after the initial concussion. But most concussions resolve before then. Uh, about 70% of the concussions are not fall in the post concussion symptom category. So that really brings us to our, 
the purpose of our study, which was to identify the relationship between fear avoidance, anxiety, and depression with acute concussion symptoms and symptom severity in athletes. Uh, so the big difference here has been looking at the acute part, which is within 48 hours after suffering an injury. Um, our hypothesis was that athletes with higher athlete fear avoidance, pain catastrophizing, kinesophobia, anxiety, and depression would suffer from more symptoms and a higher symptom severity after an acute concussion. So the materials we used was a sport concussion assessment tool uh, or known as the SCAT-5. This is something that was developed, well, the first version of it was in 97. Uh, the five refers to, it's updated uh, every two years. So that's the most recent one. Uh, we have an athlete fear avoidance questionnaire, which is a scale we've developed here uh, that measures the level of fear avoidance in athletes. We also used the hospital anxiety and depression scale uh, the pain catastrophizing scale and the Tampa scale of kinesophobia to measure all of our psychosocial variables. Our procedures are quite simple as when an athlete suffered a concussion, we were contacted usually by the athletic therapist or medical staff associated with the school. The athlete was then assessed within 48 hours of suffering the injury and filled out all the materials that we talked about before. Uh, and then the athletes completed the scales and that, that was it. Um, these procedures are quite brief. They sound quite brief. This actually took us three years to conduct this study because it was a real challenge to assess everybody. And the, we had a lot of dropouts and we had some people that were unable to fill out all the scales, for example. Um, so this was actually, even though it's uh, just three bullets here, it actually took some time to conduct this research. We approached, well, we measured 60 athletes uh, after receiving a concussion impact, but we only had complete data from 38 participants. And our final analysis was 34 participants because not everyone filled everything out correctly. So, and these are 34 concussed athletes from two local CJEPs and a local university. The average age of our participants was 20.9 years old and there's our average height and weight. And this is, can uh, so here's a bit of the demographic information. We had 23 males and 11 females. You can see all the different sports that we had there. Most of our participants came from ice hockey. Uh, and then also most of our participants came from university. Okay. Okay, so here's our results. Uh, these are, well, these are most of our main findings. Uh, we had a bunch of different results from the scales, but uh, in general, what was interesting to look at was that most of the people that were participating in this study had received at least one concussion prior. You can see on average, people suffered 1.9 concussions uh, uh, each prior to this uh, being concussed here. The total number of symptoms on average was 7.4 uh, plus or minus 5.1 and that would be out of 22. So that's a decent number of symptoms on average that people experienced. The symptom severity score was 16.3. Uh, the average hours from initial injury to assessment was 33.4. This was important because the SCAT-5 is most valid and reliable within 48 hours after the injury. The average pain catastrophizing score was 8.2. And then the athlete fear avoidance score was 18.4. So what we were really interested in is, was the relationship between these variables, right? So the total number, these are our key findings now. So the total number of symptoms reported on the SCAT-5 was significantly associated with the athlete fear avoidance score. So what that means is that athletes that had a higher athlete fear avoidance score experienced more symptoms than people who didn't. Uh, this was also, there was a significant correlation between the, num the symptom severity score on the SCAD-5 was also associated with a higher athlete fear avoidance score. So this was similar to our uh, hypothesis. Uh, also, the total number of symptoms reported on the SCAD-5 was significantly associated with depression and anxiety, meaning that the higher level of depression or the more anxiety an athlete had they would report more symptoms compared to others. 
uh, and the symptom severity score was also associated with the depression and anxiety. Uh, we put these variables into a linear regression. Um, this is a bit more robust analysis than the correlation. So the athlete fear avoidance, depression, and anxiety score model was a significant predictor of the total number of symptoms reported in the SCAD-5, accounting for 50.4% of the variance. Uh, in addition, the athlete fear avoidance, depression, and anxiety model was a significant predictor of the total number of symptoms, uh, symptom severity part, accounting for the 41% of the variance. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, is the athlete fear avoidance, depression, and anxiety are related to the number of symptoms and symptom severity of acute concussions in athletes? Um, and this is something that's been a real challenge in concussion research. The, the fact that the number of symptoms don't necessarily correlate with the pathology. Uh, most imaging studies are negative, meaning that there's no significant um, markers of a concussion on an MRI, for example. Uh, and so that's what makes this a real challenge. So the fact that the psychological variables explain some of the variability in symptoms is important uh, because this could potentially increase the accuracy of the diagnosis or assessment of athletes uh, going forward. Um, another point here, this is a good point in the second one was athlete fear avoidance is something that we screen for prior to the season. So what that means is that if you can identify an athlete that has high fear avoidance, uh, even in the off season before coming, they might be prone to, if they get concussed, would have more symptoms than someone else. And so that's something that there's some uh, emerging research, and again, in low back pain, where people address the fear avoidance and lower the fear avoidance when they're not symptomatic and then experience less problems uh, afterwards. So that'd be something that'd be really good for future research. Uh, and then again, the take home message is really that the psychosocial factors can explain some of the variants and symptoms of acutely concussed athletes. So this is it's gonna help identify, you know, what really causes some people to have more uh, symptoms than others. So uh, that's it. So that's the end of my talk uh, for my part. Uh, what the way we're going to be running it today is that um, next Dr. Corona is going to be presenting his talk and then at the end of his we're going to both of us will answer questions on either talk so um, uh, so without further ado uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Caron uh, start and uh, thanks very much and I look forward to your questions afterwards. Yeah, great, uh, great talk, uh, Dr. Dover. That was uh, was really interesting, and I and I hope I'm able to convince you that it's psychosocial symptoms uh, are related to more than just symptom severity throughout my talk. Maybe we'll, maybe that'll be something we can discuss a bit later on. So uh, I'll share my screen. Hopefully, uh, you can see it. Maybe I could get a thumbs up or. Uh... All good. All right. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks very much, um, everyone, for for being here and and uh, and for listening. Uh, great, uh, great, great uh, talk right before mine. Uh, very related, and and hopefully I'm able to complement uh, some of the findings of of what we just learned about. So, um, I guess by way of introduction, my name is Jeff Caron. I'm an assistant professor at uh, the University of Montreal in the School of Kinesiology and Physical Activity Sciences. I'm also uh, a member of CREER, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Rehabilitation. And I'm also a mental performance consultant, which is uh, a designation given by the Canadian Sports Psychology Association for uh, professionals who work with athletes, uh, coaches, performers, artists, uh, related to their performance, well being, and enjoyment in sport and physical activity. So uh, I guess the other point I want to mention uh, is as a former uh, as a former ice hockey athlete myself, uh, Canadian major junior and um, and 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 university, um, this is this is a topic that that is really uh, close to my heart. Something uh, something that I've experienced myself, and um, and I think that'll come through. And and the only reason I mentioned my my athletic uh, background is um, because that relates to the ways in which I conducted my research and and how I interpreted those findings. Um, in preparing this talk, I, I realized that I spent, a, I did my graduate studies at McGill and, and I'm an assistant professor, obviously at, um, at University of Montreal, but I don't have any specific ties with, uh, with Concordia University. 
but luckily I was able to, uh, to dig up this photo of my partner who, uh, who was a member of the Concordia Women's Ice Hockey Program uh, before the, the rebranding uh, went in. So there's no, there's carefully, there's no year on that photo or anything. So I didn't get myself into too much trouble. Um, and she told me not to uh, mention where she was in the photo, although she's front and center. So um, although Dr. Dover did kind of a nice background uh, about what concussions are, I, I kind of, perhaps it's a new audience, perhaps some people joined us late. So I'll go over some of the, 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 the concussion 101, if you will, and then talk more about um, the psychology of concussion or psychosocial aspects of concussion, which, which really interests me. 25% um, uh, of Canadians over the age of 15 participate in sport each year, which is great. Uh, we know in our society that uh, unfortunately uh, we're, we're becoming more and more sedentary, less and less physically active. So sport participation is one way to get that physical activity. Um, unfortunately, with playing sport, uh, there comes the, the added risk of suffering injuries. Um, Approximately 66% of adolescents are injured while playing sport. When I say adolescents, in this case, I'm referring to the study I'm referring to uh, from 12 to 19 years of age, which is also our highest uh, cohort of athletes playing sport. Um, th there's large economic burden associated with injuries. Uh, approximately $27 billion spent each year, direct and indirect costs associated with treating individuals with injury. So it is a, it is certainly something that, that should be of interest to all of us. And then of course, uh, one of these injuries is, is sport related concussion. Uh, in certain sports, uh, concussions can represent up to almost 50% of all injuries suffered. So um, definitely an injury that is prominent in, in our sporting uh, society. Whenever you talk about concussions, though, um, it's, it's a very large subject. Uh, there is a lot of information about concussions on the internet. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, um, Dr. Google has, has uh, created uh, the ability for everyone to have, to have access to information. Um, I'd say the unfortunate part of that is uh, we don't always know if we can trust the types of information that we're getting. So uh, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about uh, where I got my information from and, and, the, and the groups that really form kind of my understanding of this, of this problem. Um, there have been a number of meetings, conferences, academic journals uh, dedicated to the study of concussion. Um, the goal is to determine the best practice and evaluation of managing of, of diagnosing or evaluating concussion and managing the injury. These groups have put out position statements, recommendations or guidelines. I'm um, thinking of the American Academy of Neurology, the National Athletic Training Association. Uh, there's been a number of physician groups uh, internationally who have put out position statements. Uh, there's, there's been dozens of these. Um, the group that, that, that I most closely align with is the concussion in sport group. Um, they're, uh, they've, they've held five meetings up, up to now, beginning in, in the early 2000s. They have a meeting approximately every four or five years, and they produce a consensus statement on concussion uh, at, the, at, the end of their, at the end of their meeting. Um, the most recent of which was uh, the Berlin Conference in 2016, uh, a highly cited paper. Uh, as I put here on the screen, you know, on, on Google Scholar, they have more than 2,000 citations since it was published in, in the year uh, 2017. So in, incredibly uh, uh, widely circulated publication. And it's been downloaded as many as 200,000 times. So just to give you a sense of how prominent this particular consensus statement is for shaping international best practice. And, and a lot of what I'm going to present to you today is, is in line with, with um, the recommendations put forth by this particular group. So the concussion sport group, they define a concussion as a traumatic brain injury induced by biomechanical forces. Uh, and, and it's manifested in one or more of the following. So you can have a number of different symptoms, somatic, cognitive, emotional. There are physical signs of concussion. There may be behavioral changes. You may experience balance or cognitive impairment and sleep disturbance. So again, you may experience one or more of the following uh, of those uh, domains, if you will, when you, when you experience a concussion. 
in many cases, the observe, there, there are uh, no observable signs. Uh, I'm missing the word no in there. There are no observable signs of injury following acute injury. So that means that athletes may appear, uh, you know, in, in quotations, normal to teammates, parents, coaches, and teachers. And when I say normal, I mean relative to their, their, their typical disposition. Uh, in most cases, symptoms of sport-related concussion are clinically resolved within two weeks. And, and when I say that, I mean adults and within about one month for, for younger individuals, uh, I'm talking about children. Additionally, there's approximately 30% of concussed individuals who will experience protracted symptoms. So that would be longer than the typical window of recovery that we would expect for, as I put in the previous point, adults or children. So that would be adults who experience symptoms for more than two weeks or children who experience symptoms for more than a month. So again, almost a third of people who get a concussion have that experience. So uh, this is an important uh, popular segment of, the, of that population. As I mentioned, this is a, a massive topic. It was a recent study done by uh, Eagle and colleagues. And what they did was they did a, a network analysis of sport-related concussion research during the past, well, I guess the past decade, yeah. And um, what I thought was interesting was they found different keyword clusters of sport-related concussion research. And these are some of the areas that are most commonly researched on the topic of concussions. So epidemiology, rehabilitation, biomechanics, imaging, assessment, mental health, neurocognition, symptoms, impairment. Uh, Dr. Dover mentioned a variety of these in, in his previous talk. And the reason I'm presenting that for you now is I've bolded the areas in which that I think kind of my research program, you know, humbly, of course, fits into. Um, I think one thing that, that, that um, maybe distinguishes or, or, or is complementary of my research program is that I'm a, I'm a social scientist. Uh, my background is in sports psychology, uh, and uh, that's where I did my PhD, and, and I'm also a qualitative researcher. So I approach these issues uh, from maybe a different lens, which offers maybe some complementary um, uh, information to, to what we currently know. I've also been involved in a couple of recent projects that have really shaped my uh, understanding of this injury. Um, one on the left, that was a, 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 an edited book project that uh, myself and, and Dr. Gordon Bloom from McGill University, we worked on. Uh, we invited uh, a number of different scholars from Canada, the US and, and the UK, and perhaps abroad to, to write chapters on various aspects related to the psychology of sport-related concussion. And based on that book, we were approached by the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology to write a position paper um, about the psychological aspects of sport-related concussion, because this is such an emerging kind of area, and and uh, and a position paper is just kind of summarizing the knowledge and and attempting to to push our understanding further. Um, I, unfortunately, I won't dive too much into these here, just because I want to talk about some of the exploratory work we've done. But you know, just giving you a, a taste of of what I mean by the psychosocial aspects of concussion. Um, as, as noted in, in the first presentation, depression and anxiety have received the most empirical attention uh, when we talk about the psychology of concussion. There are other mood and emotional symptoms associated with a concussion, sadness, anger, hostility, nervousness, fear, and avoidance, if that sounds familiar from our previous presentation. Another thing that may not be known is, or, or maybe news to, to some of you listening in today, is that uh, anxiety and mood-related issues represent primary symptoms in approximately 30% of concussion cases. So again, that's, that's a significant portion of individuals presenting with concussion that, are, that, that report anxiety or mood-related issues as the primary concern that they have. Another tricky thing with concussion is that psychological symptoms, anxiety, depression, like we talked about earlier, they can overlap with psychological responses to sport injury. And what I mean by that is when you experience any type of injury, not just concussion, you may experience isolation, anger, confusion related to the injury rehabilitation process. And sometimes it's difficult to determine the etiology of what is, what is the etiology of the symptoms? Is it the injury or is it other factors? Another tricky part about concussion is that uh, 
as was noted in the first presentation, there's no one diagnostic test uh, for a sport-related concussion. And the SCAT-5 that was noted earlier, well, that's a self-report. And unfortunately, with self-report, we're relying on the athletes to be honest. Unfortunately, athletes are not always honest. Um, I've, I've listed here sandbagging, underreporting, and malingering. Sandbagging is when you're taking, for example, a neurocognitive test at the beginning of the season, and you, on purpose, uh, perform poorly on your neurocognitive testing because you know that perhaps if you were to receive a concussion, your scores would then be compared. I know this because that's something that I've done in the past. And I'm sure if I figured it out, I'm not the only one that, that's done that. Underreporting is, is when you do not disclose symptoms of a concussion for a variety of reasons. One, you may not know it's a you know, concussion. You may not know what's going on and you, and you underreport it. Or uh, you may not want to disclose that injury because you want to keep playing. You don't want to let your teams down. Malingering, it sounds like kind of the catastrophizing uh, that I saw in that fear avoidance model at the beginning. Malingering is when you, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you make your symptoms at worst to be than what they are. So that can be for many different reasons. Uh, an interesting one is when you don't want to retire from a sport, but a concussion presents a convenient way to uh, no longer continue your sport participation. So I hope I'm starting to paint a picture about how murky concussion is. And finally, one last point I'll, I'll just touch on, sociocultural factors. In our society, uh, we, we celebrate athletes who demonstrate toughness, who play through pain, who minimize weakness and injuries. Uh, there's tons of examples. If, if you're a golf fan, uh, Brooks Kepka was playing in the Masters last week, and the, the, the commentators were, were commenting on, on uh, you know, how it was very admirable, how he had a surgery so recently to the Masters and was able to push through the pain and, and continue playing. Uh, ultimately, that's not a smart decision and, and something that was not advisable. But again, just to reinforce the point that that is something that we, uh, we, we champion in our society. So now on to um, my, my portion of the talk. What I, what I wanna share with you today is, is my research program and, and my horrific uh, research design, or my design skills. So um, if you think about this image here as being a concussion, uh, I'm interested in educating people about concussions and I'm interested in return to sport. Okay, uh, that's very, very generic. Um, and everything that I study is underpinned by first starting with athletes' experiences with concussions. So that's the foundation of my research program. I'm, I'm ultimately interested in better understanding the lived experience with concussion. And in turn, that helps me better educate athletes about concussions and, and help them with their return to sport. I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about athletes' experiences with concussions. I'm just going to highlight two, two studies that I've, I've, I've worked on. And uh, if I have time, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get into some of the return to sport uh, stuff that's emerging in, in my research program. And, um, and I think it'll complement some of, some of what uh, Dr. Dover was presenting on uh, earlier. So uh, beginning first with understanding athletes lived experiences of concussions. So I'm, I'm going to present to you two, uh, two papers that... Uh, that touch on different aspects of the psychology or psychosocial aspects of, of sport-related concussion. Okay, the, the first of which uh, was actually the first paper I, I was ever involved in uh, with sport-related concussion. It was, uh, it was my master's thesis, in fact. And, um, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to, to understand what are the effects of, of multiple concussions on retired National Hockey League players. So um, just as a bit of a background, um, Perhaps you, you might know this, but the culture of ice hockey, it, it, it encourages athletes to, to play through pain, to, to not show any signs of weakness. Uh, pictured here is, is one of the athletes with a black eye and stitches under his eye. And, and that would be something that would be celebrated. So playing through pain is something that is encouraged and, and, uh, and usually rewarded. Athletes who, uh, this is previous mus research on different musculoskeletal injuries, but um, Athletes who suffer a career-ending injury uh, have reported uh, depression, substance abuse, and even suicidal ideation. And at the time when, when I was getting into this work, uh, so uh, I guess in the late 2000s or 2010 kind of era, that time, um, 
there was starting to be more evidence that that athletes were suffering psychological uh, sequelae. And, and what I mean by that, uh, the, the study I have there is from uh, Dr. Chen from, uh, from McGill University, and they did functional magnetic resonance imaging and, and compared concussed individuals to normal you know, uh, uh, patient populations and found that there, there were significant uh, psychological symptoms or psychological problems going on with, with the individuals who had a concussion when compared to a, to a normal population. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to, uh, from a qualitative lens, just explore what NHL athletes, what their lived experience was with, with multiple concussions. So we wanted to know how were they affected uh, by their career ending concussions. And uh, we want to know how they experienced the transition or their career termination transition. That was kind of what we set out to do. We, uh, we interviewed five former National Hockey League players who played the majority of their careers in either the 80s, 90s, or 2000s. Uh, each of the men, they played more than uh, 10 professional seasons. They suffered medically diagnosed concussions. And at the time that I, that I spoke with them, they had been retired uh, between four and 14 seasons. So what I did, uh, I met with each of the men um, uh, in, in kind of a face-to-face semi-structured interview uh, type of setting where, where I, I introduced myself, my, my background uh, in, in ice hockey with concussions as kind of an icebreaker and to build rapport with them. And, and what I want to do is, is make them feel obviously comfortable talking to me about this topic, but know that this was going to be anonymous and that I wasn't going to be you know, sharing their names or, or any identifiable information about them um, uh, in, the, in the study. So I, I really want to know what they experienced and, and, and more so how they experienced uh, what they went through. Um, I, I won't get too much into the methodological piece, although I'm very happy to have this discussion with you if you'd like to uh, at a later point. But um, the, the type of qualitative methodology that we used was interpretive phenomenological analysis, which uh, for sake of today is uh, a method in which that I, as the researcher, was interpreting the athlete's interpretation of their past experiences. So if you think about an event in your life or a significant event, uh, over time, the event may shift and change in terms of meaning and uh, you know the expression, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Well, we were interested in their story, their representation of those events. So I, my role was to interpret their stories the best, the best way that I could. The, um, th there were a number of different kind of themes that, that we thought were, were quite relevant. I put a line through social influences because I'm gonna to touch on that in, in the next uh, study that I present. So in what follows, I'm going to present uh, five quotes from five different athletes that represent um, each of these different uh, themes that we found. Um, each of the, the quotes will be represented by a different colored bubble, so you know it's coming from a different athlete. I'll read the entire quote, but I bolded and underlined uh, the parts of the quote that I think are particularly interesting for, for you. So uh, here we go. So... Um, this was something that I, I learned from many of the men. Um, I, I couldn't tell you how many concussions I had. So one of the athletes, oh, again, I'm using pseudonyms uh, and I'm using, uh, these are fake names and, and you won't see any, um, any references to who these individuals are. So uh, one, in, one, one of the athletes uh, said, I can't remember my first one. I have four documented concussions and there are numerous ones that I played through. There's no way I could ever put a number on it because it was never really recognized as a concussion although it is well north of 10. This was something that we, was a common refrain throughout all of the interviews. Um, and, and, and honestly, the, the sense that I got, you know, putting my interpretive lens on this, uh, I don't get the sense that they would have admitted to having a concussion, even if they knew that they had had a concussion, just wasn't part of the culture uh, of the sport at that time. Or, or, and, and the state of medical uh, research wasn't, wasn't where it is today. Uh, for me, it was headaches, sleep patterns, dizziness, and loss of peripheral vision, not only during their career, but as you'll see in this next quote, uh, in their post-career. So one of the athletes says, I'm not as sharp as I was communication-wise. Uh, I'm not able to focus for long periods of time uh, or process things as well or as quickly. I used to love to read, but you know, longer than a half hour, I still can't do it. And if I do, then I'm dead tired. I'm less tired after going to the gym for an hour than I am after reading for half an hour. So again, hitting home on that cognitive 
uh, impairment that, that these men felt that they were experiencing. Now it is tough to disentangle what are natural processes of aging, what could be other factors, uh, but again, uh, for the purposes of this research, I'm interested in, in, in their stories and how they construct knowledge. And, and for these men, they felt that it really was the concussions uh, that, are, that are leading to these problems. Um, you're on your own little island. Um, for three weeks, nobody understood what was happening to me. I'll never forget that because in that three-week period, I never felt so alone in my life. And from that point, I went on a real downhill spiral. So, um, the, the, unfortunately, in sports, mental health is still something that is a little bit taboo. Going to see a psychologist or going to see someone like myself, a mental performance consultant, is still met with great trepidation. So, uh, I can only imagine uh, at the time uh, um, for, for these men what, what they must have been going through with, with something so new like a concussion. Uh, I'm really thinking I'm losing my mind. So um, one of the athletes said, and this is quite a powerful quote, I was at the point where I'd be driving along and would think about going full speed and hitting the wall, just end it. The pain was unbelievable. I had headaches every day for a minimum of three and, three and a half years. So many times I just wanted to end it. So um, the feelings, so obviously this was a very powerful moment for me. Uh, at the time I was, I was you know, doing a, a, my master's thesis. And, and in fact, this was in the first interview that I conducted. And uh, it's really powerful when you see somebody that, um, that uh, you've either seen on television or, or at one point in your life idolized and, and then they admit this to you. Uh, lots of feelings of guilt go along with this as well. Um, you know, these people have families. And so a lot, a lot of different emotions going on with these people, um, which I think is uh, an interesting, uh, interesting thing to consider when you think about concussion. And now we're talking about the transition from, from being somebody who, you know, I'm not a hockey player anymore, I'm just a regular guy. So losing your sense of identity is the hardest thing in the world. You go on the road, you go to the rink, it's that atmosphere that you had. Now you're home alone and you don't feel great all the time. It's the weirdest thing to retire so young because it's all you've ever known. You're not a hockey player anymore, you're just a regular guy. Of course, of course these people aren't just regular guys. Um, they've, they've, um, they certainly have a higher profile than, than, than a lot of us, um, but I, sh shifting your identity to something that you've known and you feel very competent at to something that's unknown is, is very challenging for people. And, uh, and that identity piece is, is something that uh, I don't think gets brought up enough um, uh, for athletes who are going through this injury. So that's, uh, that's the first study that I want to present to you. And, and I'll shift into the, the second study, which, which looks at more of the, the social dynamics involved in the recovery and return to sport process. So by way of a little background, um, sport team membership is important for athletes' social identities. Uh, we're at, I guess we're not at Concordia, it's all virtual, but uh, if we were at Concordia, we'd see a lot of Stinger logos and we'd see a lot of, of, of athletic uh, jackets. That's an important way to identify yourself um, through, uh, through, through wearing your, your branded team materials and, and makes you feel like you're part of something. It's unclear how being part of a sport team uh, facilitates or hinders your recovery from a concussion. There was one study from, uh, from Surya and colleagues, they looked at um, how, how teams uh, can either facilitate or hinder recovery from other types of injuries, but it's not yet known how teams can uh, can help or hinder uh, with, the, with respect to your concussion. And uh, we know that coaches and teammates are very influential people in, in the athletes or in the lives of athletes. So what we want to do is we want to understand how reintegrating into the, the team environment following a concussion impacts athletes, their teammates, and overall team functioning. So how do we do that? Well, we recruited three high status university athletes who suffered a concussion and returned to sport. So high status in quotations. What I mean by that is somebody who has a, who is a prominent figure on a team, uh, for example, a starter on a team. So somebody whose absence from the team would be felt. Um, we took it for granted that somebody that was more high status, they would have a bigger impact. You would notice them leaving the team and coming back into the team environment more so than an athlete that plays a, uh, um, a lesser role on the team. So after we recruited each of these athletes, we then asked them to identify one teammate and one coach who could discuss their experiences in some detail. 
So in the end, what we had was three athlete teammates coach triads. Okay, that's who we studied for this, for this particular um, study. Uh, we did separate interviews with each member of the athlete team H coach uh, triad. Um, and the way in which we uh, analyzed the data was, was using thematic narrative analysis. And, and what that means is we were trying to tell a story or find one main thread uh, within each triad that really was salient or, or interesting with respect to, to their, their experience with the concussion. And, and uh, I'm presenting these stories from the position of the story analyst as opposed to the storyteller. So I'm not inserting myself into the story. I'm just presenting the story as it was, as it was told to me. So a uh, little bit busy of a slide, but these, again, these are pseudonyms that are used here for, for each individual. And we've changed the sports of each of the athletes, um, just again, to preserve confidentiality. Although we are, we're not looking at sociocultural things. I know there are, uh, for example, rugby is a good one. Rugby has very unique sociocultural uh, features of that sport, but that's not the lens through which we're looking at the data. So we changed the sports. We changed uh, just just we changed that just to preserve confidentiality of the athletes. So um, if you look at each column, this would represent one case. So we have Cassie's story, Jess's story, and Jaden's story. Um, in each case, we have an athlete, teammate, and coach. As you can see with the athletes, they were all league all-stars, so high-status athletes, uh, or they were the league rookie of the year. Uh, the teammates were either roommates or a captain on the team, so again, somebody that could really speak to the concussion. And, and all of the coaches were either the head coach or an assistant coach, somebody who was really there and, and lived the concussion day to day. So I'm not going to present all three stories because we only have so much time, but I'm going to present uh, two of them, uh, I guess parts of two of them. So. The first one is uh, Jess's story. So Jess was a league all-star. She suffered a concussion her fourth year. Um, and, and as you see here, uh, Jess is going to be in light blue. Amanda's going to be in red. And Robert, the coach, will be in gray. So when I present quotes and, and what follows, that's, that's who the different quotes are from, just so you're, there's no confusion. So here's a little bit about Jess. Who, who is Jess? This is obviously not a photo of Jess. And Jess isn't her real name. Um, so. The second string goaltender sustained an injury, which meant that the team's third string goaltender would be Jess's backup for the season. Uh, through our conversations with Jess, Amanda, her teammate, and Robert, the coach, it was clear that Jess's concussion was going to be really detrimental for the team's chances of success. Jess described to us two separate incidents that occurred about one week apart that resulted in her concussion diagnosis. Uh, Jess said that she started vomiting and became unconscious after the second collision. Um, aside from being concerned for Jess's health, uh, Jess's teammates and coaches were equally concerned about how Jess's absence might impact the team's performance. So the way in which we, we interpreted this data was through the lens of pressure. Uh, and that was the main plot point that we, we looked at in this story. So I'll tell you what I mean. So um, we asked Jess to describe the general feeling uh, or sorry, we asked uh, one of Jess's teammates to describe the general feeling in the dressing room after Jess's concussion. And they were worried about Jess and the team. So everyone was thinking about the future and thinking about how Jess was at the moment. She went out in an ambulance, so the general consensus was pretty worried. Also about the future of the team. With Jess being hurt, that's a big blow to the team. So interesting. So already off the bat, we have athletes kind of saying, yeah, I'm worried about the athlete's well-being, but what does this mean for us? So there's kind of that interesting uh, interplay between worried about somebody's health and worried about what that means for the team. So we asked Jess about what were her expectations about returning to the lineup after her concussion. She said, you don't want to come back too early. But at the same time, I was pretty eager to get back because, you know, we we're doing pretty well and we were on a roll. You know, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself, you know, being the starting goaltender. I really wanted to make a difference with the team. So it was a pretty fast recovery for such a severe injury. So, again, uh, putting pressure, so internal forms of pressure, uh, not necessarily anything that was overtly placed on, on Jess was, was something that was important for her returning to sport experience. 
We also asked Jess's coach about his perspective on reintegrating athletes into the team environment following a concussion. And he said, uh, my advice would be to um, would be to downplay the concussion a little bit, because I think the more you talk about it and the more you make special adjustments for players, you know, if you can eliminate, you know, the talk about it and everything like that, I think it allows players just to go about their day to day routine a little bit more easily. It allows them to heal uh, quicker. So we really appreciated the coach's candor in saying this, um, because I think if you get coaches in a candid moment, I'm not going to highlight anyone in particular, but I think if you get coaches in a candid moment, they might tell you something like this, um, which is, yeah, let's let the athlete get better, but let's not make a big deal about it either. Uh, you often hear coaches talk about the, the, the C word. We don't want to use the C word around our athletes, concussion, because once it's a concussion, it takes on a life of its own, which is interesting. So again, we interpreted pressure through this lens. The coach isn't necessarily being awful or anything like that, but um, you know, they're, they want to downplay the concussion a little bit. So we asked, you know, we're talking to Jess again. She said, you know, again, I don't want to fault our medical staff. Like we did take the proper steps. It was just really fast. And, you know, I can I can be faulted too, because I'm the one who said, I feel good, but it's just that pressure. Like they said, I'm okay. So I'm okay then. So it's kind of a tricky situation because you're stuck between what you're feeling and obviously the pressures of, we need you back. And it was never outright uh, said, but it was implied. So very much dancing around this subject of nobody said we need you back, but that's what you interpreted from everyone. Perhaps everyone, you know, questioning, are you okay? You look better. You might, you, you look like you're about ready to come back. Um, so again, I think that's interesting to, to, to look at pressure in that way. So the, uh, the second story that I'm going to present to you, the second and final story with this study, uh, is about Jaden. And, and this is a basketball, he was a basketball athlete. So as, uh, as his coach noted, Jaden was the fun, lovable, goofy, make everyone in the laugh kind of character. And he did a great job of helping integrate some of our younger athletes into the team. Jaden had a strong personality, uh, which seemed to be a bit of a double-edged sword. So Jaden sometimes is a little bit opinionated, and he just believes it's his way or the highway. Uh, Jaden did not feel that he received the type of support he wanted from his teammates and coaches during his recovery. Conversely, and, and what we thought was interesting, Alex and Patrick, his uh, teammate and coach, believed that they were giving him the support that he needed at that time, not necessarily the support he wanted. So this disconnect and the tensions that arose as a result are, are what we uh, based his story on. So they talked a lot about accountability in the story, which I thought was interesting. So a really big foundation of our team is accountability. So one of the questions we had, what were your expectations of, of Jaden when he was returning to the group? So the teammates said, like, if we, if we knew you, speaking to the interviewer, were concussed, we, would, we, would come, we wouldn't come play video games with you. So I guess the guys would be very cautious of that until Jaden was medically cleared. So again, we know you have a concussion. We're not going to really make your symptoms worse by hanging out with you. Again, providing support, but maybe not in the way that Jaden wants. Patrick, the coach, we were very much encouraging, encouraging of him. And we told him, hey, you know, we know that you're an avid video game player and we know that you like to enjoy the nightlife. Perhaps it's not the best thing to do paired with video games, paired with the fact that you just had a concussion if you're really trying to get back to your goals. So I think our mindset with Jaden was always remember your expectations of being part of this team. Again, not necessarily doing everything that Jaden wants, but giving them or giving Jaden the, the type of support they thought he needed. So, you know, again, we're asking Jaden, you know, like how, how he's talking a lot about the support he didn't get throughout his concussion recovery. Um, and we had just asked, you know, what, if, if, a, if a teammate of yours had a concussion in the future, what, what would you do? And he said, I would honestly hang out with them as much as possible. It would be nice to have social interactions because it's almost like your whole life is on hold, right? Because you can't go out and see your friends. You can't go out and do the things you like to do but people keep living their lives. So we interpreted that as him not getting what he wanted out of people, but people really attempting to do what they thought was in his best interest. So it's kind of like a game of broken telephone, uh, which is interesting, uh, which, which screams communication intervention, which screams let's work on communication skills with these people. But uh, again, that's, that's something of interest. How, how am I doing for time here? Uh, Wendy, am I, am I okay or? You're good, you can keep going. I'm good. All right. I don't have much left. So I'll go over this next part. Uh, 
a little quicker. So I've talked to you a little bit about athletes, uh, their experiences with concussions and, and specifically the lens through which I look at this problem through a qualitative approach, through athlete lived experience. Uh, I'm unfortunately not gonna be able to talk about education, although I would love to, I have lots to say about that, but I'm, I'm not going to today. Um, I am gonna talk about returning to sport. So, all right, return to sport. Perhaps you've seen this. If you're involved in the sport world, you likely have. This is the graduated return to sport uh, protocol, uh, which is a six step graduated process. And the goal as this arrow shows, you go from symptom limited activity in phase one or stage one, light aerobic activity, sport specific exercise, et cetera, all the way you build it back up slowly until you get back into a game. Great. I've bolded a couple things here that stick out to me. So where's the psychology in all of this? We've been talking about, or I've been beating the drum with kind of psychosocial symptoms and how they play a role in our return to sport. Yet through my view, um, increased thinking and restoring confidence as goals are, um, I would say nice goals, but there's no clear indication of how we're going to accomplish that. So um, I've become very interested in this idea of what does, what is the psychology of returning to sport? So looking at some of the literature, what's been published on musculoskeletal injuries, um, we wrote an editorial about just asking the question, are athletes psychologically ready for sport following a concussion? You've, you've returned to sport, you've done this graduate or return to play protocol, but does that mean that you're actually psychologically ready for sport? So within this editorial, uh, some of the ideas or postulates that we had moving forward were what are the key components of psychological readiness among concussed athletes do formerly concussed athletes who receive medical clearance actually report being underprepared because that would demonstrate obviously that there is something there and what are the implications for psychological readiness on return to sport outcomes so we wrote this editorial i was you know, fired up. Let's 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 get going. Let's let's go do some exploratory work. And when I uh, when I first presented this this project or, or proposed project um, at the uh, Canadian Traumatic Brain Injury Research Consortium meeting, uh, scholars across Canada were interested in concussion. Um, essentially, some some very kind people said, you know, Jeff, maybe you should pump the brakes a little bit here. Do a review first figure out what the literature, what's out there in the literature, what are some of the outcome measures that are out there? What are some of the factors, psychological factors involved in being ready to return to sport before answering some of these questions? So um, I listened and what we're, we're, you know, days, hopefully days away from submitting this review. Um, and I thought I'd just share with you briefly kind of some of what we found. And this is where I think it links in with what Dr. Dover was presenting uh, earlier on. So uh, the goal of this uh, review was to identify key concepts and outcome measures that are associated with psychological readiness to return to sport following a sport-related concussion. So we did a systematic review. Uh, we had the help of um, uh, Dr. Sampson, who's a research librarian at, at CHEO Hospital in Ottawa. So she's tremendous at developing protocols for systematic review. So um, to not ruin her, her great work, I won't present too much of that because I, I'm sure I would not present it correctly. So of, of, the, of the almost you know, 3,500 studies that, that we initially hit on, uh, we found that 13 of them really examined psychological aspects of returning to sport following a sport-related concussion. Nine of them were quantitative cohort studies uh, and, and four were qualitative studies. I'm going to present a very generic overview here, although I would love to talk about this more. Um, we found kind of three overarching themes from both the quantitative findings and the qualitative findings that, that to us appear to be related with psychological readiness to return to sport. So fear, this sounds familiar from the first presentation. Although I might break it down a little bit more. I might, it may not just be Anyways, it seems to be multidimensional, this concept of fear. So fear of recurrent concussion or subsequent injury, fear of returning to sport, that might be more of the fear avoidance piece that Dr. Dover was talking about. But then there was also a fear of losing playing status or not being able to return to your previous status. So again, only four of the 13 studies talked about fear. So it's not something that's widely researched in the, in the concussion space. 
But it is interesting that it does appear to be multidimensional in nature. And there, there seems to be quite a bit going on there. And I think avoidance, like we learned about earlier, is, is certainly one piece of that. Um, a lot of the studies also talked about emotional factors, uh, what we labeled as emotional factors. So uh, depression, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, depression, anxiety are, are two of the most talked about psychological symptoms when it comes to concussion. So it was no uh, surprise to us that depression and anxiety and, and perceived stress were represented uh, the majority of, of what we found and, and mental health and mood were other uh, factors that, that appear to play a role in, in psych readiness when, when we're talking about going back to sport. And there are also some psychosocial factors that, that were pretty interesting. So uh, social support, uh, internal and external pressures, and the sense of identity. So these are other factors that appear to be related to psychological readiness, whatever that means. And I'm gonna tell you what I mean by whatever that means. So I mentioned earlier in the graduate return to sport protocol, confidence is, is a goal of step five, yet no study has specifically investigated confidence. Seems like a bit of a gap in the literature. There is a, sub, uh, there is a scale out there in the literature, uh, the injury psych, uh, the psychological readiness to return to sports scale, the IPRRS, um, and that's six items that are all that all hit on the notion of confidence. Hasn't been a whole lot of research using that specific scale, uh, and there's been no uh, research on confidence and return to sport following a concussion. So there's a big gap there. There is no standardized definition of what psychological readiness even means. So. Uh, we don't even know what we're talking about yet. So um, these are some of the, the dimensions that I believe could be involved in psychological readiness uh, based on the review. And um, we hope to learn more about those different dimensions in, in the coming years. And most of the outcome measures used have not been val validated with concussed athlete populations. Uh, there's been a number of subscales or scales used, subscales used, and, uh, and they haven't been yet validated with concussed athlete populations. So uh, it's unclear the extent to which we can have the reliability in what we're measuring. So we, we, there's still some, some uncertainty there. We have, some, we have about three qualitative projects undergo at the moment that we're just currently uh, not ready, not ready for prime time uh, to present yet. But um, one of the studies, uh, health, a variety of healthcare, healthcare practitioners who work with concussed athletes, ATs, PTs, sports medicine physicians, coaches, athletes, and we want to understand what they think it means to be ready to go back to sport after concussion. And then we've done a couple more, uh, couple more studies underway with, with athletes specifically. So I'll, I'll leave it there, unfortunately, but uh, just maybe to summarize and, and some points for discussion. Um, I hope I've convinced you that, that there are psychosocial symptoms, that there's a wide variety of them, um, and that they do impact uh, not, only, not only the injury experience, but perhaps also our return to sport. Things like isolation, pressure, maybe even social support. Uh, fear, as we learned about in the first presentation today. Uh, our identity is an important piece of the puzzle that, that doesn't really seem to come out in a lot of the work yet. Um, identity is a very tricky, which one of my graduate students would attest to, our personal and social identities. Uh, it's, it's tricky to, to understand all of this. And, and there is quite a bit of literature on this topic, but in other domains, not necessarily in concussion. So we're going to continue exploring that. And then career transition, losing your identity, how that all plays into to navigating the new normal. Uh, the provision and interpretation of social support. So just because people want to be helpful doesn't mean it'll always be interpreted as such. So um, need, to, need to not just provide social support, but the right type at the right time from the right person. Uh, and, and related to the last point uh, that I presented on, um, we're, we're, not, we're not sufficiently accounting for psychosocial variables in the, re, in the return to sport uh, protocols yet. Uh, that's a goal of mine moving forward, that we can develop some tools that can be used uh, by people on the sidelines, because ultimately all of this has to get in the hands of the people who matter, and that's making athletes safer and equipping people with decision aids or clinical tools to, to improve uh, their work. Uh, very biased, but as a mental performance consultant, I think we can work with 
uh, with athletes, with coaches, with teams, with groups to improve uh, athletes ret recovery and return to sport. Uh, that's all I have. A uh, quick shot of my team uh, who are working on various aspects of this at the moment. And uh, I'm very, very happy to take any questions uh, from, from you now. So thanks for your time. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, that was really great. Uh, I loved all the different studies and aspects that you guys have been looking at. Uh, so at this point now, we're going to open it up to questions from the attendees. Uh, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom thing. You can just type your question in there. And then uh, either myself or Dr. Caron will uh, do our best to answer it. Uh, we'll start with the first one here, Dr. Caron. I'll, I'll send it your way. It was uh, to what degree are factors such as macho posturing and tough guy or tough gal implicit, if at all, in any of the studies and results? Oh, great question. Um, I would say, uh, so first of all, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. That's not exactly what we were looking at. But um, if I had to guess, um, it depends on the individual. Uh, it depends on the degree to which you identify, um, perhaps within your athlete role, perhaps how you see yourself within the team, how you see your role, it depends on the sport. Uh, if we're talking about sports like I, I touched on rugby earlier, rugby has a really interesting culture. Uh, ice hockey, of course, in, in, in Canada, North America, American football, uh, internationally sports like Aussie rules football rugby again so it, it I think it, it really depends but I would say that um, being a tough guy or gal as you put it uh, I think that definitely factors in and and uh, and should be taken into account uh, moving forward in, in research there's one of my colleagues Dr. Dominic Malcolm he's he's in the UK he's a sports sociologist and this is really what his work focuses in on. So if you're interested in learning more about this, Dr. Dominic Malcolm does some, some great work uh, on that topic. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the next question. This one is for Jeff Dover. Uh, how do you, there's a three-part question. How do you think the athlete's competitive level might affect the results? So for example, the Jeff versus the university. Uh, does an athlete concussion history have an impact on their psychosocial assessment scores? Meaning if they've had more than one concussion, would that affect it? And do you think that a sample of non-athletes would report similar findings to those you found with athletes? All right, a lot of questions there. Do you think, so briefly, how do you think athletes' competitive level affects the results? I don't think it does. I think that we assume that athletes at a higher level would be better with pain or better with fear avoidance or things like that. But I think that they struggle with it just as much as lower level athletes. I don't know if the distribution is the same, that there might be more people on a high school team that would have trouble with pain versus uh, at a pro team, but there are still people that struggle with that. So I don't think that that actually plays a factor. Um, I don't think the athlete's concussion history has an impact on the psychosocial assessment of it because there's some studies that show that if you've experienced more injuries, then it's less. And if you, because you've had that experience and you've gotten over it, then there's some studies that show that if you've had that experience that it is elevated because it's, you know, you know what it's gonna be like and how hard it was. Uh, so I think it's really a case by case basis there. And then do you think that a sample of non-athletes report similar findings as opponent athletes? Okay, so that one's tough because all of our stuff that we look at is similar to Dr. Cameron where it's like return to play. And so non-athletes don't have a return to play date. Uh, so I don't know what it would be for that. The, the, our area has always been to like, what's, why is someone taking longer to rehab than others? And so in order to answer that, they need to be, have a reason to return. So that one's tough to answer. Okay, so next question for Dr. Caron. How do you think the concussion experience might be different for players in the women's hockey league uh, compared to the men, for example? Yeah, great question. So. Um... I guess, I guess as a first point, um, the, the, the athletes that I interviewed for that first study I presented, um, that was during a time uh, when, uh, you know, being kind, medical knowledge was just less of, of concussion and, and they didn't know as much about the injury as we do today. Um, however, that being said, if I was to redo that study today, let's say NHL athletes today, this day and age, and NWHL athletes, so the, uh, and I assume that's the National Women's Hockey League that you're referring to, um, I think the first thing that would be very noticeable is the resources 
the difference in resources that that are apparent for at this stage of the game, the NHL versus the NWHL. Um, the NHL has tremendous resources. These athletes are paid uh, more than fairly to do their job, uh, whereas the women are not paid anything or fairly at all. So um, I think the experience, just even if we start at that level, I think the experience would be probably completely different uh, all the way through their recovery, their return to sport, their availability of care. We talked about some of those pressures also, internal, external pressures. Um, I, I, I can only assume how that would be different. Um, unfortunately, I'd just be guessing though. Uh, but I, I think for, for those reasons, availability of resources, um, I think that's, that's one of the things that stands out to me. Great. Uh, okay, so the next question, do you believe that there is a decent assessment tool for psychosocial factors that is geared toward validity, uh, validity and reliability for current concussed people, which I think you alluded to a little bit at the end of your talk there, but the second part of the question is really interesting too, would it require a baseline? So. Oh, oh I'll take that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no. Uh, is, a, is a quick one. So no, uh, there's, there's, there's decent assessments in that there are probably psychosocial assessments that, that were developed in different contexts. Uh, for example, there is there are ACL, a lot of research done around ACL, like we talked about the Tampa scale. So fear, uh, kinesiophobia in that sense. Um, there are also re-injury anxiety type of measures out there. But again, they're not specific to concussed athletes. So I think a first step would be making sure that they're validated within a concussed athlete population. And then the second part, and I agree, this is interesting. Um, so baseline, baseline testing is a really interesting concept with concussion right now. Um, the, so as I alluded to the concussion sport group, um, their most recent consensus conference, they do not recommend baseline testing anymore. Uh, because of all the variability within neurocognitive testing. So if you think about yourself, um, you might be more of a morning person or you might be more of a night owl, let's say. Depending on when you take that test during the day, your score may differ just from any number of reasons. Um, and then when you factor in a concussion to that and then a different time of day, perhaps, than when you took the test initially, it could further skew findings or, or create uncertain findings. So Ultimately, they're, they're not certain. And, and I also talked about things like sandbagging. Uh, so you can actually influence the results of your performance on a test. So uh, long-winded to say that baseline testing is not necessarily the be-all, end-all. I think it does give you another tool to make an informed decision, but it's a clinical decision, right? It has to be made by somebody with expertise on the sidelines who can, or, or in the clinic who can really make that call. So I think there's some measures out there that could be kind of adapted, tailored to meet your needs, but no, there's nothing out there right now that's that's that great. That's a great point about the baseline testing. I remember there was um, a professor in North Carolina that was talking about the be benefit them later when they do the post-testing. So that was a, it's a great example there. Okay, so next question for Dr. Carroll. To what extent, this is a good question, to what extent can the social strengths of the team sports be intentionally leveraged to facilitate return to sport among students with high levels of psychological factors without unduly uh, pressuring them? It's too bad. I, I don't know if I get a chance to follow up here because I'm not sure if I understand what social strengths of a team uh, would mean. Um, I'll ask Melanie to clarify the question if you want. Yeah, Melanie, could you clarify? Sure. So Melanie, if you want, you can uh, put in a bit or yeah, sure. Come on in. Hi, thank you. So what I'm wondering is there are significant strengths of belonging to a team sport, um, whether it's identification with the team, whether it's um, social ties and developing social ties with a team and so forth. Does that help to clarify? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think I can think I'll try here. Um, so uh, I think ultimately there's there's one um, uh, there's one concept that that I've read about recently called psychological safety that I think is is a pretty interesting concept. It's the idea. It's from industrial organizational psychology. It's this idea where 
you create a safe space on teams uh, for athletes to voice their opinions. So if you've ever had the feeling, perhaps in an undergraduate class or a graduate class where you, you don't really want to put up your hand because you're worried people might judge you. So psychological safety would be you have created this environment where everyone feels safe to speak their mind, be honest, and, and, and so forth. So I guess maybe what I would say is perhaps that would be one way to intervene and, and, and help athletes. Because yes, they're, they're, as you put it, social strengths of sports teams. Uh, perhaps one of the, the, the social strengths of a team is that people typically feel like they belong uh, to their team and they feel like they have camaraderie uh, within their team. So perhaps that uh, and, and creating an environment where people truly do feel uh, supported and safe to, to speak their mind uh, would be one way to, to maybe help uh, lessen the types of pressures that athlete may, athletes may feel, whether nonverbal, interpreted externally or pressures that they put on themselves. Yeah, the only thing I was going to think about with that is that I was really struck by with one part of uh, Dr. Corwin's presentation about what the coach said when the player was injured and in, with concussion. And they were saying that, you know, we're, we're not going to talk about it and because we don't want it to because I don't want to be a thing and and things like that. And it was uh, and I've, I've always been struck by what coaches feel like they can control their players talking about or the environments, you know, like they can they'll say things, but it, you know, everyone knows that this person's concussed. Then if you tell someone not to talk about it, then they're going to, I would have thought that in that scenario with the team environment, like we all know that this person's concussed, we want them to get better. We don't want to put any undue pressure on them. So the way I would frame it is like, we want to provide them support because they're still part of the team, even though they're not playing right now, but what can we do to support them? We can't go play video games with them because we're trying to decrease screen time, but we can go for walks. So who wants to be in charge of setting up the schedule of who's going to go visit Sally and go for a walk every day, you know, something like that, where they're still involved with the team, but in a safe environment for the coming back, you know? So that was what uh, I always feel. I mean, but I'm, you know, it's easy to say that from the research side of things, but it's in terms of addressing the team, I always felt like it was being upfront was better than trying not to talk about something, but that was just my take on it. Um, okay, so next one. Both of you mentioned fears, important part of the psychology of the post-concussion. Uh, but fear of what? Is it, is it pain? Is it health? Is it future performance? Uh, and that's a great question. I think we both could probably answer parts of this. The, um, our scale that we developed, which is athlete fear avoidance, is really was named after the model because that's what we were going for. But fear avoidance isn't a good term. It's a little bit like plastic glass, right? Like it doesn't tell, it doesn't say what you're actually fear of. And the reason for that is because there's multiple factors in that model. So in our athlete scale, we actually had fear of the injury, fear of movement, fear of losing the starting position. Those are all different aspects in that scale. Um, and it's, and it's, the avoidance part is what the behavior changes when you have that stuff. So, so uh, I fully agree with you. There's in the fear avoidance model, there's also fear of pain and kinesophobia, like Dr. Caron was talking about, which is the fear of movement, but also in the same scale as fear of re-injury. So that scale has been really, hasn't resonated well with the concussion research yet because there's the movement part of it isn't really resonating with the concussion part but the fear of re-injury is but that's only a small aspect of the scale and that's why the the interview and the qualitative process that Dr. Carmel was talking about was so important because that's a great example of that scale is it could not measure it accurately you know and the only way you're going to get that is through the the analysis with the interview so uh, that's my take on the fear Dr. Carmel. Oh very little to offer that's very that's very interesting to know that um that you're you're your measure offers more than just the avoidance, right? I, I think I think that's interesting because that that aligns well with what our review found. There's there's multiple components to fear. Um, I, I noticed Noah Silverberg. Some of his research was was cited on, on uh, an earlier one of your slides, and, and and another type of phobia that that Noah has written about is uh, is uh, cognophobia. So the fear the fear of mental exertion. So which could be. Uh, uh, interesting for when we're thinking about different fears that could be uh, available or potential for athletes with a concussion who are returning to activity. So that's another one that I don't know if that fits in better with the return to school stuff or the return to sports stuff or maybe both. I don't know. Uh, that's a really good point. 
Okay, so next question, um, Dr. Caron, you spoke briefly about education or that you, you wouldn't speak about it. Uh, what approaches can we take to educate novice coaches about pressuring athletes to return and providing the athletes with emotional support? Yeah, great question. Uh, Dr. Wilkinson, it's nice to see your words typed on a screen, but it'd be better if we were maybe having a, a beverage somewhere. Um, so I, I, whenever I talk about coaches, um, I, I think it's important to understand that a lot of coaches are, are volunteers. A lot of coaches are doing the best they can uh, with very limited resources and perhaps very limited time uh, because they have jobs and they have other demands on, the, on their time. So um, I'm, always, I'm always a little reticent as to what we should do with coaches because ultimately it's not really, there's so many different things that coaches have to know about this day and age. Concussion is let's say one of them, but also other injuries. There's also doping in sport. There's also any number of the different social issues that are going on uh, that have really come to light over the, the last number of years, whether we're talking about Me Too or Black Lives Matter. So there are a number of different domains that the coaches have to be proficient. So whenever I speak about concussion education with coaches, I like to offer that little um, caveat. What should coaches know about concussions? Well, there's a great resource that's created by the Concussion Sport Group. It's called the Concussion Recognition Tool. It's a handheld, it fits in your pocket, and it's got a few signs and symptoms. We're not asking coaches to diagnose concussions, nor should they. It's just signs of serious injury where that's not right. We should get the athlete out, remove them, and refer. So uh, honestly, it would be as simple as that uh, in terms of, of big education you know, across the board, what, what should we be doing? To me, that's it. Making sure that they are able to identify and remove and that they feel that they have enough training to do that and um, they, they feel confident in their abilities to do that. Um, part of the question though was educating novice coaches about pressuring athletes to return and providing athletes with emotional support. So uh, from some of the qualitative work we've done, um, athletes talk about being drowned in are you okays? And what I mean by that is you come in a room and, or an athlete comes to the training facility and the first person they see is the coach. Hey, how you doing? Oh, still don't feel great or whatever. They go to see the first play person in the, in the dress. How are you feeling? You look good. No, I still don't feel good. So they have to explain themselves 16 different times, which makes them internalize the concussion even more. So I think one, one way that I've worked with coaches to help facilitate a more supportive environment is uh, just for the coach to take a leading role and say, hey, look, so-and-so, uh, -so, uh, talk to the athlete, see what they need, and then just say that to all the teammates. Hey, um, you know, Jeff isn't, Jeff is still, uh, has his concussion, so maybe just, you know, don't, don't talk to him about the concussion because that's not what he wants right now. Uh, versus maybe, maybe I'm somebody that really wants to talk about it and that would be good for me. Again, so maybe empowering the coach to speak to the concussed individual saying, hey, what do you need from me? How can I help you uh, in this in this environment. That's what I would say. Great, very good. So at this point, uh, that's been all the questions. We have a couple more minutes. If anyone wants to type in a last minute question, we'd be happy to attempt to answer it. Um, yeah, I really, uh, I thought you had a really good point. I, one of the things I really liked in your talk too was the, just the acknowledgement of the concussion group and the amount of work that they've done. I was fascinated when they identified the, I think it was 13 clinical or questions. They did the 13 systematic reviews and the, which is the amount of work that that must've taken was crazy. And it's one of, it's really one of the more impressive research accomplishments that I'd seen in any real, you know, place like that. It was really impressive. Okay, uh, Dr. Kilron, do you think Stage four and five of the return to play guide should be longer to increase the athlete's confidence before they return to play. I'm laughing only because do we know why there's six steps in the return to play protocol? <laughs> yes. I, lo I love this answer. It's uh, because there's six days in between NFL games. It's mm -hmm. completely arbitrary. So the, the, the return to play steps as a, as a whole are not evidence-based yet. We continue to use them. It's, 
that's why I'm laughing when I see this question, not because it's a bad question or anything like that. Um, it's just, it's kind of arbitrary at this point. So why six steps? Why not two? Why not 12? What, you know, what, what, what's going on here? Um, do you think stage four and five should be longer? Um, I don't know. Uh, again, concussion is such a heterogeneous injury that is so individualized. Uh, there's so many different things that athletes can go through. Um, I think the treatment and rehabilitation of concussed athletes should be very, very individualized. Um, I, I would hesitate to honestly put anyone into any type of standardized protocol. I mean, I think, I think ultimately the return to play steps are, are achieve their goal, which is we want to gradually increase their physical activity until they're able to resume pre act pre concussion levels of activity. Um, but maybe athletes don't need confidence. Maybe, maybe they have lots of confidence when they go back. Maybe they need something else. Um, confidence is something that is mentioned in the return to play or return to sports steps, but um, why not other variables? Uh, I think, I think depending on the individual athlete, they could be in need of other things. You know, we talked a lot about fear today. Um, are fear and confidence related? Maybe. Uh, social support, maybe there's identity related issues. Maybe there's, there's a whole host of things that I think could be looked at. Um, confidence is one of them, certainly. Uh, but confidence is a poorly defined and really complex uh, process if we're, if we're thinking about something. So confidence is kind of a catch-all term. It's kind of like when, uh, when people use the term mental toughness, it's kind of like a conceptual, uh, I don't know, catch-all. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, my answer would be, uh, unfortunately, I don't know. Um, but, but the return to sports steps are, are something that I'm, I'm always interested in and, and why we're still using six. I, uh, for me, I doesn't, it wasn't, I wasn't as concerned about the length. I think if you made it longer, I don't know if that's what's needed. I think what's needed is the plan on how to improve the confidence. So just because we made stage four and five longer doesn't mean we're actually addressing the confidence. So that, that was the part that was missing for me for the return to play guideline is that if they've identified confidence, something that needs to be improved, what do you do exactly to improve confidence? Which really relates to what Dr. Caron was just saying, because like we don't, you know, what is confidence and what is it for each individual person and how they would get it, you know, would, would be different. So that, that'd be extra hard for me. Uh, okay, well, I think that's the end of the question. Oh, let's, uh, Eva's, uh, Wendy, you're gonna have to answer that question. Will the recording of the Zoom be available after? Yes, it will be available on the form website. Give us about a day or so for the editing. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all the questions we have today. I'd uh, really like to thank Dr. Caron for presenting today. It was a really great talk. It covered many different areas and uh, really applicable to a lot of the concussions and sports and uh, things that are happening right now. So thanks very much for uh, presenting today. It was a real pleasure to, to have you. And um, uh, thanks again for all the attendees uh, for attending. And it was, uh, it was really great. So thank you very much, everybody. Yep, thanks for having me.